Okay, we're going to go ahead and continue with the next portion of the musculoskeletal system video assessment. And um, we ended on the portion of the lower extremities uh, where we had finished uh, talking about the legs and the knees. And uh, we are now finishing the, last, finishing the last portion of the musculoskeletal system assessment where it includes the feet and the ankles. Mm -hmm. So um, I have the patient here and he is standing uh, at this time. And uh, we want to take a look here at the feet and at the ankles, um, just uh, making sure that we assess this correctly. So right here we have our metatarsal bones. And these are our, our um, uh, phalangeal uh, joints, just like we had in the hands. So this joint here, just like we had in the knuckles, is called the meta, meta um, tarso phalangeal joints here. So these are the ones that we need to assess uh, and palpate, but we'll do that at a, at a later time. Um, here we have our medial malleolus, and out here we have our lateral malleolus. Same on this side here. In the back, we're going to go ahead and ask our patient to go ahead and turn around. On our back side, we have our Achilles tendon, which is this one right here. So. Uh, now that we know um, all the features of the feet and the ankles, um, most of the most important ones, now we can begin to inspect them. So right now what we're looking at here is when you look at the patient, you want to make sure that uh, the way that he stands on his foot is, uh, is in correct alignment. Um, he should be uh, standing where it is right in the middle, midline, of his foot. We're going to go ahead and ask him to turn around. Um, now if the heel is midline it should sit um, at the second and third toes. So right where this comes down it should be right where the second and the third toe is when you look at it here. So that is what we're seeing here. Sometimes you'll see some patients that um, they stand and they, they, they sit more on the inner portion um, of their foot, so it's it's they're they're more pronated is what they call it. So um, you want to definitely take a look at, uh, and and make sure that that is not occurring in your own patient when you are assessing them. Um, after you take a look at that, I'm going to go ahead and ask the patient to go ahead and bring his foot and rotate it sideways so we can take a look at that arch. Now in this case. Um, we have a very slight arch, not too much though. I would say this patient is more of a, has more of a flat foot there, but in most cases you'll see that the patients have longitudinal arches. So um, the contour of the foot is a little bit different in this case. Um, also, um, we want to we also inspect the tibia, so let's go ahead and ask our patient to go ahead and stand the way that he was before. So we want to inspect our tibia as well, um, and that's, that's what we use to, to make sure that we are aligned correctly. Um, and we're going to go ahead and assess our toes, just like we did the phalanges of our hands, making sure that they are in a straight position facing forward and symmetrical. Um, and that they don't um, they don't curve any which way, making sure that their position, their size, and the number of toes is correct as well. So um, then after we do that, we're going to go ahead and ask our patient to go ahead and turn around one more time. We're going to go ahead and uh, go into palpation. So go ahead and begin to palpate the Achilles tendon. There should be um, no, no tenderness, swelling noted when you touch the tendons here. Um, no, no abnormalities. And then we're going to go ahead and ask our patient to turn around one more time. And then we're going to go ahead and palpate uh, the anterior portion of the ankle. So right here we're going to go ahead and palpate and make sure that there's no tenderness and swelling or nodules uh, there either. And then we're going to go ahead and palpate the medial and the lateral um, uh, areas here that we were talking about, and then go ahead and um, assess the in between the metatarso uh, phalangeal joints here, just like we did before, making sure that we don't find any abnormalities, tenderness, swelling, and then uh, overall inspect for discoloration or anything of the sort. Um, lastly, we're going to go ahead and check the range of motion. So when we do this, we're going to go ahead and ask uh, our patient to go ahead and sit down on this chair here so that we may do this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, 
Let's go ahead and come around this way so we can look at it uh, from a lateral view. So we're going to go ahead and ask our patient to kindly dorsiflex his foot, which means just upward towards the ceiling as much as he can. And they should be able to dorsiflex to about 20 degrees. And then we're going to go ahead and ask him to plantar flex, which is, means just towards the ground. And this should be at a 45 degree angle that he is able to do this. And then we're going to go ahead and do a, a somewhat inversion of this foot going inward. So the bottom of the foot goes inward or medial uh, inward and towards the body. And in this case, uh, he should be able to um, invert his foot about 30 degrees and then just the opposite, do an eversion outward. And sometimes you may have to do this. Um, now that one will be a lot less so you should see uh, about um, a 20 degree uh, eversion that they're able to make. And then after that, we're gonna go ahead and do an abduction and adduction. So this is just a rotating of the, of the foot outward and then inward. So um, you would expect an abduction of 10 degrees and then adduction uh, inward um, of 20 degrees. So um, these are the different angles uh, that you can expect the foot to rotate, and these are all normal. And in any case, just like we had done in the past with all the other muscles, when you are assessing the muscle strength, for example, with dorsiflexion, I'm going to go ahead and push down while he pushes up, and then I'm going to go ahead and push up as he pushes down. So that's the way you assess range of motion as well. Now, we're going to go ahead and continue... Um, uh, the, the assessment has been completed now with the lower extremities, but we're going to go ahead and further evaluate specific joints um, with some additional procedures that we've seen before during the assessment, but this is more specified to uh, specific um, abnormalities um, that, that we may need to diagnose, but we need further support uh, to, to be able to, to diagnose them. So in the case of carpal tunnel syndrome, let's start with that one. We're going to keep our patient lying here. And what we're going to do is we're going to perform a series of tests um, to evaluate the median nerve. Now we're going to have him place his hand here. Now we're going to have, have him place it in a palmer position. And when we do this, the first test we're going to, we're going to uh, perform is that of the um, thumb adduction abduction test. So we're going to have him put his thumb upwards such as this. I'm going to press down and he's going to push up. Now if he feels pain when he's doing this, he, he that is a positive sign of a possibility of carpal tunnel syndrome. Now there's another uh, test called uh, a tinnel test or tinnel sign um, may you. And when you do the tinnel sign, what you end up doing is you ask him to place his palm up once again and what you do is you use your third or your index finger and you tap the middle portion now if he feels pain all the way up this area where the median nerve lies then he most likely has carpal tunnel syndrome lastly uh, there's another test called the Fallon test and that Fallon test also requires um, that the that the patient also place in actuality both his hands in a position such as this and to keep them in this position for about a minute. Now if the patient begins to have tingling or numbness in the fingers after the minute has gone by that is a positive sign of them having carpal tunnel syndrome. Now the last test, you can go ahead and put your arms out, the last test um, is actually just an assessment of the hand where you ask the patient where they're feeling the numbness, where they're feeling the tingling and the pain and they use what they call a cat's hand diagram in order to assess what the classic signs in, uh, in, um, what the classic signs or areas of, of uh, those symptoms or signs lie on that could be indicative of the carpal tunnel syndrome. Now, uh, when we're looking at the rotator cuff, now we're going on to a ne the next um, particular uh, joint. So let's say that we're assessing the rotator cuff and we're thinking that there may be some type of abnormality there. So when we do this, we're gonna go ahead and ask the patient to go ahead 
and perform what they call a near test. Now when we do a near test, we're gonna ask him to forward, um, flex his arm all the way up to the side of his head. And when we're doing this, we're gonna go ahead and depress the scapula. So he's gonna put his arm upward and then we're gonna depress the scapula from behind. And if he feels pain as he's placing his arm upward like this, as I'm pushing down on the scapula, that could be indicative of uh, maybe some type of tear or some type of abnormality in that rotator cuff. Now, the Hawkins test. Now the Hawkins test is one where we're gonna ask the patient to go ahead and place his arm out in about a 90 degree angle um, and then we're going to put pressure to bring it down and he's going to put pressure to bring it up. Now if he has pain or weakness in doing that, we know that there's a rotator cuff problem. Now he's going to have to sit up a little bit more in order to do the next test. And with this next test, go ahead and stand. We're going to go ahead and ask him to place his arm at his side and then we're going to ask him to bring his arm up and just the same, we're gonna be pushing inward as he's pushing outward. And then we're gonna be pushing outward as he's pushing inward. If either of those two movements is difficult for them, then you know that we have a rotator cuff problem. So um, that completes the near and the Hawkins test. Um, and then that also tested the strength of some other muscles that are included in that rotator cuff assessment. So then we're gonna go ahead and evaluate the lower spine. So we're gonna have him stand sideways, and then when we assess this lower part of the spine, um, we're gonna have him do a series of uh, tests. We're actually gonna have him lie down on this uh, bed here so that we can perform them. You, you must have the patient in a supine position to begin with, supine. And can you horizontal? Okay, in this test, we're gonna go ahead and ask the patient to lift his head up off the bed and then also raise his legs. Just one leg. If he has uh, pain when he's doing this or difficulty in doing this, you know that most likely he may have something like a herniated disc. Now, um, we're gonna go ahead and place him in a prone position next, and this is what we call the femoral stretch test. Now, the first one was called a straight leg, um, raising test. Now we're doing the femoral stress, um, oh, the femoral stretch test. So we're going to go ahead and ask him to um, extend his, uh, his leg upward and keep his knee straight. And if he has difficulty in doing this, then uh, just as well, we know that this is uh, indicative of some type of lower spine problem. Now, um, the first test that we perform where he was in the supine position, if we find that we perform the same test on the contralateral side and that the pain crosses over, we know that we may have something called sciatica where the sciatic nerve is uh, impinging on one of the nerves. Or I mean the sciatic nerve is being impinged upon um, by maybe a herniated disc or some other um, problem. So uh, now let's look at the hip, okay? When we're, when we're looking at something that could be caused by a hip problem, um, we perform something called the Thomas test. Now the Thomas test includes uh, the patient and he's gonna go ahead and uh, lay in the supine position once again. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask him to go ahead and bring his knee to his chest while trying to keep the other leg completely straight. Now if he has problems doing this, um, he may have uh, some problem in the hip area um, called a hip flexion contracture. When this leg over here cannot be uh, left straight and it keeps coming up when he bends this knee, that's when you know you have a problem. Now, um, we also have something called the Trendelenburg test. So we're gonna, in this test, we're actually gonna have him stand up. So when he stands, we're gonna have him balance on one foot and then we're gonna have him balance on the other foot. When he does this, he needs to have his shirt off because we need to be taking a look at his uh, iliac crest. When we do this, we're looking to see if by any chance there is a change in the iliac crest. So if you would turn around. So if he stands on one foot and then he stands on the other foot, 
And we see that the iliac crest uh, changes and is asymmetrical when he switches like that. Then we know that we may have weakness on, um, on the side of the lifted leg. Okay, weakness of the abductor muscles um, during the test. So then we're going to go ahead and assess the knee next, and we're going to have him sit down for this one. So in this test, uh, we're going to use something called the Belotman test. We're going to have him um, bring up his shorts so we can actually see his knees. So when we look at the Belot, when we are doing the Belotman test, we, we're, what we're doing is we're putting pressure not only on the patella, but we're also putting pressure on the suprapatellar pouch. So we'd be putting pressure here and here, and we'd be trying to see if uh, there is an effusion there. So what you're trying to do is getting all of that fluid out and pressing down and then letting go and then lightly putting your hand on there so you can feel if the patella comes back up and kind of sits there um, uh, like in a, in a pool of fluid. Okay, but you are trying to feel for that patella to push back out. And then um, that would be a positive sign of a possible fluid in the knee. Then the McMurray test is actually another one that tests for uh, a meniscus tear. And when we do that, we're actually looking um, to rotate uh, that knee. So what we're going to do is we're going to have him uh, bring up his legs one more time. And we're going to have him bend his knee. We'll come on the lateral side. Have, his, have him bend his knee and bring it up like this. Now what, what the clinician is going to do, we're going to have our hands here and we're going to hold here and what we're going to do is we're going to rotate that foot outward and then extend and flex the knee and see if there's any crepitus clicking, popping or anything going on over here as we're placing our hands here and then go ahead and uh, bring that, um, uh, rotate that foot inward and do the same thing extending and flexing the knee, extending and flexing the knee, and seeing if there's any popping that we feel or clicking or anything of that sort there. Um, if, if you do find that any of those uh, things are occurring, that you know that you do have a positive, um, possible um, positive meniscus tear. Um, now, the last one is called the Lachman test that we're gonna perform. Now in this one, what we do, and you might have seen physicians do this before, um, they're going to hold your your knee here, and then they're going to pull it outward while they push the femur down, and then they're going to push inward. Okay, so they're, they're doing opposite forces, pushing here, pulling here, pulling here, pushing here. And then what they're trying to do is to see the how well the ligament here um, actually holds your femur and your tibia in place. If he finds that there's... Um, at least a five uh, millimeter difference when they do that of a shift when they do that then um, there, there's too much laxity in that ligament and um, that's not good because it, it could uh, be possibly from an injury that you may have had to that knee. Um, now we, I do want to add just one more thing is just the fact that um, if you suspect that um, when you're looking at the limbs and you find that you, you may be thinking, oh my gosh, you know, one leg looks longer than the other one or shorter than the other one, or, uh, you know, just the circumference of the thighs or, or um, of the calves uh, don't correlate with one another. Um, you always want to measure and compare the size of the both just to make sure and then look, um, look more thoroughly into the reasons why that could be happening. So that concludes the portion of the musculoskeletal system assessment. We thank you for watching. Um, please tune in for the next video we'll be doing on the neurological system. Thanks.